Here's where my head's been at lately. A while back, I'm having a conversation with a friend and the Apostles' Creed comes up. This is probably the most important Christian document outside of the Bible. It's a fourth century succinct summary of Christian theology. And it is really, really short. It's the kind of thing that's so short that people memorize it. And Christians all around the world, regardless of what brand of Christianity they practice, recite this thing in church. And maybe it's rattling around in the back of your head right now, even as I talk about it. But it never occurred to me until that conversation that there are only three human names in that very important summary of Christian faith. One, obviously, is Jesus, because, I mean, the religion's named after him. The second is Mary. Okay, I could see that one coming. But the third, and you kind of cheated because you saw the title, is Pontius Pilate. Well, then I got to think, I know some stuff about the first two, but I don't really know much about him. So I got curious. I started rifling through some of these books back here, and I discovered that there isn't really consensus on what the deal is with this man once you get outside of the Bible and a few ancient sources. So I waded out into the deep water of the internet looking for one place where everything was put together in a consumable, orderly fashion. And there was a bunch of good stuff, but nothing like that. I thought, come on, internet, get your act together. Somebody should go and make something like this. And then I thought, that's exactly what I went to college for again and again. It's what I taught college for, and it's what I do for a living now. I could make such a thing. And so that's what I've set out to do. My undergraduate degrees in history, my graduate degrees in theology and history, my postgrad is in history of the West and Western thought, and well, this is what I'm trained for. So I've done a ton of research and I've tried to package it up in a way that'll be fun for you to consume too. I am so excited to tear into this with you. So let's go learn some stuff about Pontius Pilate together. And Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And today we're going to start out with a group participation exercise. So I'm going to have you look at this ink blot. And I'm going to have you tell me what you think you see there. And I'm not actually going to hear you because of the nature of how YouTube works. But ready? Three, two, one. What did you come up with? And I'm going to pretend like I listened. And guess what? Whatever you said, you are absolutely right. Because it's a Rorschach test, right? It's a, a projective test that psychologists use to figure out where you're at in your headspace and emotionally. And the trick is that you put something up here that provides just enough structure and context that it kind of looks like something, but that is also ambiguous enough that again, what you're feeling and wrestling with and how you see the world can be projected into that image. Well, history kind of works the same way. There are a handful of characters who just came along at exactly the right moment and just played exactly the right role enough that, that we find ourselves with enough data, enough context to know something about them, but there's also enough ambiguity that we can project our views of history, our views of philosophy, psychology, religion, politics, all of this stuff onto that character. And one of the biggest Rorschach tests that history provides us with is this guy Pontius Pilate. And you've heard of him. He's the Roman governor of Judea from like 26, 27-ish to 36-ish AD. He's the guy who was in charge when Jesus of Nazareth was on the scene. He's the guy who oversaw Jesus' trial and who, at least according to sources, conflictedly and reluctantly sentenced Jesus to death. Now, Pilate in and of himself, maybe not that big a deal, a footnote in history, a minor governor in a passing moment. But Jesus is a pretty big deal. Probably, whether you're into him or not, the most influential person in human history. He certainly casts the longest shadow of any person in the history of ever. And so what you get in Pilate is this guy where we know some facts, some details about his personality and a few other incidents about his life just enough to give us a context. But in terms of how he responds to Jesus, he's ambiguous. He doesn't know what to make of Jesus. He's worrying about peripheral considerations. And even the trial makes it feel like he's not really thinking about the guy in front of him. He's thinking about all these externalities and other pressures. Well, that kind of sounds like the question that every human ever has to ask about Jesus. Again, whether you arrive at the conclusion that Jesus was pretty nifty or not, everyone's confronted with this question. And so resultantly, what you get is a 2,000-year history of Pontius Pilate that plays out like a Rorschach test. 
Whatever you think about the world or about God or this particular sect or that particular sect, or Jesus or philosophy or religion or politics or whatever, you'll tend to inflict that on him like a projective test. So in this video, I want to try to cut through some of that by first looking at the actual raw material facts about his life, the primary sources. And there aren't that many, so it'll only take a minute. But it's important to talk about this because a lot of times we imagine, I think, that history just materializes out of thin air. And these are the facts and these are the not facts. And in an age where we're doing worse and worse at agreeing on what actually facts are, we're going to try and get that nailed down before we go further along in this conversation. Then after we talk about how we know things about him, I want to talk about what we actually know about Pontius Pilate. What are the agreed upon facts? What is the, the story that we can reliably assemble and evaluate? Then third, I want to consider what people have done with him. I want to talk about the Rorschach test element, how different people viewed him. What are the stories? What are the, the fake quotes, the apocryphal stuff that's been assigned to him? How has he been portrayed throughout history? Then at the end of all of this, I want to add up the reliable sources, the reliable facts, all of the cloud of traditions and guesswork and fan fiction. And I want to try and put together some kind of composite evaluation of maybe who this guy actually was and what we can make of him. So once again, my name is Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and we're going to talk a lot about Pontius Pilate, and this is going to be fun. Here we go. rundown on how we know things about Pontius Pilate. Probably the most significant source outside of the Bible regarding this guy's life is Flavius Josephus, very important first century Roman historian. But interestingly, he's a Jewish guy. If you remember your first century history, the Jews and the Romans got into a bit of a tiff in there. In fact, it turned out to be a lot of a tiff, and the Romans ultimately destroyed the Jewish temple and just crushed this rebellion that cropped up in the later part of the first century. So Josephus is an interesting guy because he was on one side of that conflict to start, and then he figured out things weren't going well, and he went to the other side of that conflict. That mindset of kind of putting the finger to the wind and getting a sense of which way the political and social breeze is blowing also comes through in the way he writes. He's a good historian. He's a thorough historian, but he is not afraid to offer his own opinions and commentary. That's okay. It doesn't diminish his usefulness as a source, but we just have to know what we're dealing with when we read him. Pilate comes up a lot in Josephus's two works, The Jewish Wars and The Antiquities, and we get a pretty good profile of what kind of guy he is, and we'll get into more of that in a minute. The second source I want to talk about is an almost contemporary of Josephus, but his career really unfolded a little bit earlier than Josephus, and that is Philo of Alexandria. He was a Jewish philosopher who also had a toe in the water when it came to politics and what was going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. And there's a famous letter that he wrote to the emperor Caligula. Now, Caligula was the dumpster fire emperor who came after Emperor Tiberius, and Emperor Tiberius, of course, was the guy who was in charge of the Roman Empire when Jesus was executed. So Philo writes a letter to Caligula about some stuff that's going on involving the Jewish people, and he cites as evidence to support his petition this incident that unfolded with Pilate uh, sometime earlier, and we'll talk about those details here in a minute. Tacitus is a Roman senator and historian, and we don't get a lot from Tacitus, but in a critique of the Christians that he writes in a, a, a small passing passage a few decades after the fact, he does mention that Pontius Pilate was a procurator or governor of Judea and that he executed Jesus. A lot of scholars have spent a lot of time looking at those handful of words from Tacitus because, well, frankly, all of these are an allusion to, uh, to Jesus, if not 
in a primary sense, in a secondary way. And anything that has to do with Jesus historically, it's pretty weighty, has a lot of stakes. People tend to get really worked up about it. So Tacitus is pretty famous for that little phrase. But in terms of us and what we're doing here, it's not really that helpful because all it does is acknowledge something we already know from a bunch of other sources. This guy right here, Eusebius of Caesarea, comes along. He does his writing around 300-ish and a little bit after AD. And Eusebius is clearly drawing on a bunch of sources we don't have anymore. And that's part of what makes him so interesting. It's not really a primary source, right? Because he's writing centuries after the fact. But he knows stuff that we don't know. And he characterizes some of the players in this whole Pilate, Jesus, Judea, larger political story in ways that might help us to get a little bit better picture. So he is worth mentioning and including on this list of key primary sources. Okay. Oh, the other one. Yeah, it's the Bible. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record the interaction with Pilate. There's overwhelming agreement in terms of how they frame it. Again, all of the Gospels are trying to accomplish something a little bit different from a literary perspective. They're all trying to accomplish something a little bit different theologically, but the the facts line up pretty neatly. And in the Gospel of Matthew, you even got a situation where he characterizes Pilate as not wanting anything to do with this predicament and famously washing his hands of the whole affair before ordering the execution. So all of these sources are helpful. They come from different angles. They come from different eras, but all still relatively close to the fact But you might be saying, okay, but these are old documents. Who knows what was actually written when? How reliable can words actually be? You know what would be great in a situation like this is if there was just a smoking gun artifact, like a rock that somebody just dug up right by Pilate's office building or something. This has his name right on it. It's right where it's supposed to be. Well, guess what? There is. I am here at the palace compound at Caesarea Maritima, and here is a thing they excavated from this. Kind of hard to tell, but do you recognize that name right there? Pontius Pilate. So that's nice. It's always wonderful to have physical, external corroboration of the stuff that we're trying to wrap our brains around when it comes to history. So this stone was found in the early 1960s. It wasn't really hard for people to do the math on it. It was discovered in Caesarea Maritima, which was a city that had been built just shortly before Pilate's time there. And it was the seat of Roman government. The governor's palace was there. And this rock was apparently part of a temple dedicated to Tiberius, called the Tiberium, but the stone had been repurposed to uh, rebuild or repair something that had gone awry with the adjacent theater. So somewhere around the backside of this ancient Roman theater that you can still go and visit in Caesarea if you want to, this stone was found, and there are three really crucial details on it. First is obviously the name of Pilate, which you can make out whether you read Latin or not. Second is that he is described as the prefect of Judea. So, well, that kind of sounds like him. And then third is the description of what is being dedicated with this stone, and it's the Tiberium. So clearly a temple in honor of the god-man Emperor Tiberius. But beyond that, more recently, and by more recently, I mean within a couple of months of the recording of this video, there's a ring that had been in cold storage since forever, found at Herod the Great's old palace fortress called the Herodium. It got dug up, I think, in 1969. And this little copper ring, somebody's going through the archives and they're like, oh, we never really look closely at this. Let's see what's on here. And they find Pilate's name on there. Uh, You got to look really close to figure out how the letters are arranged because they kind of circle around the ring itself. And the, the Greek there is a little bit odd instead of saying just like Pilate's ring or Pilate's coolest favorite party ring, it says basically for Pilate. So this probably wasn't a ring that Pontius Pilate himself wore, but it probably was a ring that an associate, somebody in charge of logistics, an official wore and used to make mushy stamps to say, this is for Pilate, make sure this gets where it's supposed to go, because that's a very authoritative name that I just 
stamped in there. Finally, a third piece of physical evidence that tells us that Pilate was definitely a real person and definitely procurator, governor of Judea, is that he minted coins. And you can actually still go and get these coins, hold them in your hand, and feel tangible proof and connection to the reality of this character that we're taking this time together to learn about. How do I know you can get these coins? Because I went and bought one. I got so excited about all of this pilot stuff a few weeks in, I was like, there's no reason I couldn't find one of those and spend a few dollars and get one for myself. So I did. I found somebody reliable. I bought it from them. It showed up in a neat, tidy little package. I got the thing out and I held it in my hand and I thought, this is going to be really cool for this video and for people on the internet to get to see this tangible connection to the past. I slid the thing into my pocket, carried it around for a few days, and as I did, <laughs> this thing became weirdly important to me. Maybe in a religious way, maybe just in the way that is reflective of how much I love history and how much time of my life I've put into studying this era of history and the stuff that floats around Bible history and even the stuff that floats around the people who criticize the Bible in history. I, I love this stuff here. And the longer I carried this around, I was like, I, this is the first time I've ever actually held something in my hand, man-made, that connects me to this era I've obsessed about for so long. And then I got to think about it a little further. And I was like, who's pocket has this been in? I know it's been in mine, but did Pilate carry around his own coin at some point? What about Peter? Mary Magdalene maybe had this and drag it around with her a little bit, even just one transaction. That bag of coins that Judas was in charge of keeping track of as the treasurer of the disciples, did he have this one at some point? Did Jesus, the carpenter, go down to the place to buy some supplies and have this with him, pay for something that he did? Who knows? Maybe so, maybe not, but the fact that it's even a possibility creates this bridge for me between who I am now and what I've thrown my life at now and well, people I'm really interested in from 2,000 years ago. All right, that got a little squishy and emotional, but it's the truth, and I think it's cool, and I hope you think it's cool too. I don't know if that's going to stand up there. I might move that in a second. Whatever the case, these physical evidences of the reality of Pilate, coupled with the literary historical evidences for the reality of Pilate, leave us with pretty much absolute certainty this guy was real, and he definitely worked in Judea. But the details of his story, well, they're complicated, and we get what we can from them. But before we get into the actual facts about Pilate, just a note on how we're going to do things here. Maybe you've noticed that all of these sources have Adobe Premiere morphed into this source line down here. In the next section, where we talk about Pilate's life, I'm just going to sneaky-like highlight whatever source gives us the data we're talking about at any given moment as we go along. Now, I know that still isn't fully precise. And so if you want even more and you want all the specifics and you want to see it with your own eyes, make sure to go down to the description. There's going to be a link there that will take you to my website where I'm going to have everything source-wise laid out. You will be able to go as deep into this as you want to. It's so much that I can't even fit it into the description. So for those of you who really like to geek out over this stuff, go and have fun with that when you're done watching this video. For the time being, we'll use that source line to give you a sense of who said what about Pontius Pilate as we get into the actual details of his life now. <music> So we've got a pretty good list of primary sources here, but the thing they all have in common is that they're interested in the guy's political career, and none of them give us anything about his background, his family, where he came from, so that's tough. But we can cobble together a little bit by just looking at his name. His last name is Pontius, so he's a part of the Ponti family, and we know that the Ponti family are from Samnia. Samnia is this little region just to the east of Rome on the Italian peninsula, and these guys were a pain in Rome's but over the centuries. In the fourth century, a guy named Gavius, from whom Pontius Pilate is probably directly descended or at least related, he defeated the Romans at uh, the Battle of the Caudine Forks. And then a couple centuries and change later on during the Social Wars, the people of Samnia find themselves on the opposite side from the people of Rome once again. But Rome is this giant cultural vortex, and eventually 
everything gets sucked into it, and the people of Samnia are no exception. Eventually, uh, Pilate's family becomes absorbed into the lower class nobility of Roman culture. They're what's called an equestrian family. This would be like a, a medieval knight with titles and money and lands, but not crazy rich and not crazy powerful. So it's like the bottom rung of the highest tier of society. Well, in addition to that, we know that his first name is Pilate. And that's a really unusual name in the ancient world. In fact, I'm not aware of anybody else who ever had that name ever. And it looks like it might have been a nickname. When you, when you look at it in a Latin context, it would seem that maybe Pilate was good with the the Roman javelin, something that was called a pilum, is kind of this lightweight throwing spear that's got this thin hook or spearhead on the end. Maybe he was just crazy talented as a javelinier. I don't know if that's actually what you call somebody who throws a javelin. So Pilate is maybe uh, a nickname that he gradually embraced, indicating that he probably had some military service early on in his life. Well, however you look at this, the billion dollar question here is how does someone of that relatively low rank, relatively insignificant pedigree and relatively low achievement climb all the way to the role of governor? That's a pretty big appointment. And the answer would seem to be nepotism, at least in some form. And here's the way this worked out. There is this character during the reign of Tiberius named Aelius Sejanus. And for a brief little window of time, he was probably the most powerful guy in all of Rome. Tiberius was pals with his dad, a guy named Strabo, and Sejanus rode those coattails, curried favor through valor in battle, and eventually he becomes Tiberius's right-hand man. Well, Tiberius is war-weary and a little bit beat down from politicking. And so as we get into the mid-20s AD, Tiberius pseudo-retires to the island of Capri and has surrogates running the show for him from a distance. And chief among those surrogates is this alias Sianus guy. Well, if we look at the timeline of Pontius Pilate's appointment, which would seem to have happened uh, around 26 AD, maybe he formally takes up his role there in 27 AD, and we look at the timeline of Tiberius and Sianus, it becomes pretty clear to us that that actual appointment was not made by Tiberius. It was almost certainly made by alias Sejanus. Why would Sejanus appoint a nobody like Pontius Pilate? Well, one possibility is that they had a family connection. Both of them were outsiders from Rome. But to hear the critics in history explain it, they would say it was a more nefarious connection that they had. And that being their shared disdain for the Jewish people. Josephus characterizes Pilate as being, frankly, brutal and murderous toward the Jewish people. Philo characterizes both Sejanus and Pilate as being vile toward the Jewish people. Eusebius picks up this same tone looking at all the sources that he's drawing on when he writes a few hundred years after the fact. It seems like there's enough smoke and enough chatter here to give the impression that Sejanus may have thought that Pilate would go and carry out his anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic agenda on his behalf while Tiberius wasn't really paying attention. Now, Tiberius himself didn't have the greatest track record in terms of his relationship with the Jewish people. In 19 AD, he did a mandatory conscription for young Jewish men living in and around Rome. And I think the alternative to signing up was to have your family banished. It was something along those lines. And shortly after the time of Tiberius, the Christians are famously expelled, or not the Christians, excuse me, the Jews are famously expelled once again. Maybe the Christians get caught up in that by the Emperor Claudius. So it is not far-fetched or crazy given real sources leveling the accusation and big picture historical facts that touch on the same kind of stuff to say that this charge of shared anti-Semitic agenda might have legitimacy. So whatever the case, Sejanus would seem to be the key to Pilate's appointment. That's going to be very significant as the story unfolds, so let's just put a pin in that one. Whatever the case, Pilate takes over for a guy named Valerius Gratus, who'd had a 10-year run, which seems pretty good. We don't really know much about how it actually went, because there are no sources on this that I'm aware of. 
And he sets up shop at the Roman governor's palace in Caesarea, the town I mentioned a couple minutes ago. This is a great place to govern from if you got to be there. One, it's a brand new community, master planned and designed under the supervision of Herod the Great to impress the emperors. If you're trying to impress emperors, you're going to make something nice and comfy. And it's also 75 miles away from the place where all the difficulties are happening if you're a Roman governor. It's a long ways from Jerusalem. There's a buffer zone in between. All of the religious arguing and bickering can happen down there and will mostly govern up here. Well, one of the first things, according to Josephus, that Pilate does is just a simple little troop movement. He's going to send some guys down the road to uh, set up shop at the Antonia. This is the fortress that was built adjacent to Herod's temple so that there'd be a you know, a Roman presence there in case stuff got weird, and stuff often got weird. So he sends these troops down, and they show up carrying the banners of Tiberius, which has the image of Tiberius on it. Well, the Jewish people are pretty serious about their no graven images thing, and emperors claim to be deity. So when these banners roll in adjacent to the temple, the Jewish people are like, no, not on our watch. And a whole bunch of them get together. They walk all the way up to Caesarea. They set up this protest camp in the horse track, the Hippodrome there, and they're all bent out of shape and demanding change from the governor, Pilate. Well, Pilate presumably sends somebody down to get the details, and about a week goes by, and finally he decides, well, we need to put down this little protest, this little rebellion, and make sure that they know that I'm a, a real governor. I'm not just here because some powerful person appointed me. I'm here on my own totally real, legitimate merit. So I'm going to come out here with a show of strength. And so he sends the troops out and he's like, you guys need to disperse or we're going to kill you. This is Roman territory now. Paraphrase is mine. And not paraphrase is mine. All of these Jewish protesters just bare their necks and they're like, fine, cut our throats then because it would be better to be dead than to continue to go on with this insult to the one true God happening by you having those, uh, having those banners down there. And Pilate flinches. It's like, I, I didn't really expect that response. And so he calls back his men and doesn't do any killing. Well, you might say, well, that seems like wise governance. And I think it was. But at the same time, how does Pilate come off here? Well, it's kind of weak and indecisive. And it's unclear as to who he's actually trying to please or what he's actually trying to accomplish. Oh, he's got to save some face here and, and rack up a win. So he decides to perform a public works project for the people of Jerusalem. There's this incomplete aqueduct, and he decides he's going to finish the rough, uh, roughly, I don't know, 35 miles that are left on the thing. So in keeping with things that previous governors had done, he takes some treasures out of the temple treasury and uses it to fund this building project. But that does not go well either. And so all of a sudden, there's another big protest, this time down in Jerusalem. So Pilate sends out a bunch of people, this time dressed in Jewish garb to blend in with the crowd. But they've all got whipping clubs underneath their garb. And when he gives the signal, realizing this can't all be pacified, they all get out their whooping clubs and whoop people. And uh, apparently some of them whooped a little bit too hard and people died. And the rift between Pilate and the people he's trying to govern widened even further. Somewhere in here, there's an incident that's vaguely referenced in the Bible that talks about Pilate killing some Galileans and mingling their blood with sacrifices. We don't know what that means, but it seems that there was more hubbub than what we get from the extra biblical primary sources as well. Well, now, now we're getting toward the big one. We're into 30-ish AD, and stuff has changed back in Rome. See, that Sianus guy was very ambitious. And so ambitious, in fact, that he kind of wanted to be emperor next. But in order for him to become emperor, he had to get rid of some key people who were in his way. So he did some poisoning and murdering within Tiberius's family and also did some maneuvering politically behind the scenes. And the net result is that people start to get wise to what he's doing. Tiberius is alerted to it in this dramatic turn of events. Tiberius brings him in front of everyone. And there's this lengthy letter that's being read that's rambling and incoherent. And all of a sudden it's like, and you, Sejanus, are the problem. Arrest him, boys. Sejanus goes from being the most powerful man in all of Rome to being in jail and getting reports about all of his associates and family members and political buddies being 
executed one at a time as he awaits execution. Okay, so if you're Pontius Pilate and you have your job because of Sianus, how nervous are you as this purge is going on? How long is it going to be before Tiberius remembers that I was appointed by Sianus and turns his attention to me and I get called home to get dead? This is the mindset that I think Pilate, who had a wife and tradition tells us had kids, was probably in when the whole Jesus of Nazareth thing is presented to him. All four Gospels closely agree on an indecisive, almost distracted Pilate when it comes to trying and conversing with Jesus. It's like he doesn't quite get it. It's like he doesn't quite have a category for this. It's like his mind is just elsewhere and not on the dude standing right in front of him. Pilate is having this conversation philosophically about the nature of truth, and he seems to be just at wit's end with what to do with this government assignment he has. And I think behind the text, it's a reasonably safe assumption to say he was probably pretty concerned about his own neck as well. So all of the Gospels agree that certainly the religious Jewish leaders were very enthusiastic about having Jesus executed. They even acknowledge we don't have the legal authority to do so, but you do, so you need to do this trial. At one point, Pilate's like, I look, I just doesn't seem that guilty. What if we uh, what if we do this thing with this old um, tradition that you got where this weekend every year we can just release somebody and let them off the hook? Wouldn't it be better for everybody if we just if we just let him walk and said, well, maybe he's bad, but he gets a pardon. And they're like, no, no, we want him dead. And there's this riot that's starting to stir up around the temple and kind of looks like the riot that happened over the aqueduct thing. Maybe we're flinging dust in the air and getting ready to have some kind of giant fight. And Pilate's like, I cannot afford to have riots right now. My political fate, in fact, the fate of my life and my family is on the line. And so finally, we see Pilate wash his hands of it and say, look, I don't see it. I don't get it. His blood be on your hands. Fine. Just flog him, kill him. We kill a lot of people, whatever. And so the execution of Jesus is carried out. We also find out that Joseph of Arimathea approaches Pilate, and this indicates Pilate's sympathies toward the not Jewish side of the argument a bit because he grants Joseph of Arimathea the privilege of collecting and burying Jesus' body. Sianus gets executed. Pilate continues in his position. There's no indication that we have that the purge is going to be directed at him. Surely, he's on pins and needles, but time ticks along, and he continues to try to compensate for the perception that he might not be loyal to Tiberius. Philo tells us about Pilate gathering some great artisans and commissioning them to make these nifty gilded shields, golden shields that don't have the picture of Tiberius on them. He's learned his lesson, but just have the royal inscription of Tiberius on them. And then he's going to hang them there again around the temple area in Jerusalem to honor his great friend Tiberius, like super intimate, really good friends, like the kind of friend that would never execute you on it's silly hearsay like that kind of good friends that's why i'm putting these shields up y'all and so he does this but again that inscription includes language about tiberius being descended from the gods or a son of god well he just had a big dust up over the whole son of god thing with somebody else the jewish people are still probably pretty bent about that and they're like no this is just as stupid this is unacceptable And Pilate is like, no, I don't care how much you people yell. I've had enough of being bullied by you. I'm leaving the shields up in honor of my good buddy Tiberius, who I would never dishonor by taking these things down. And so Herod himself actually jumps into the fray here, goes over Pilate's head, shoots a note to Tiberius to say, "Uh, here's what your idiot governor is doing. He's risking your whole province. And Tiberius, who just honestly, is exhausted by this point and doesn't even want to be around Roman stuff, is governing from a distance, apparently tells Pilate, like, come on, man, what are you doing? This is, that's stupid. Just take down the dumb shields. I don't care about the dumb shields. I care about not riots. Take them down. So now there's egg on Pilate's face because they went over his head and he got scolded in front of everybody by his boss and he had to concede and 
This is just really a bummer for him. It's all this dang Messiah stuff again. This time it's a Samaritan version of a Messiah who thinks that he knows where some stuff Moses had got buried up on top of Mount Gerizim, which was a holy mountain to the Samaritans. And so he gathers a whole bunch of followers and for some weird reason arms them and then marches them up the side of Mount Gerizim. And Pilate's just like, no, no more of this. And so he sends troops out to meet them on the road. It ends up turning bloody. Some of the Samaritans get killed. And then the Samaritans, again, go over Pilate's head and approach the governor of Syria, a guy named Vitellus. And he sends an emissary down the road to say, uh, Pilate, you've been deposed. Now, I don't know how that works. To me, it seems like these are both equally ranking um, offices. I don't know how one could depose the other unless Tiberius himself had let this neighboring governor know, like, this guy's not doing well, he's floundering, keep an eye on it. If there's any more stuff, just send him home. Whatever the case, the story of Pontius Pilate in Judea ends in 36 AD when he packs up his stuff and gets on a boat to go back and give his required report to Tiberius. Now, look, I think all of that story is hyper interesting, but in a way, I think this is where the story starts to get really interesting. Because the only thing we know for sure about Pilate after he got on that boat and left is that he never met with Tiberius because Tiberius died on the trip home, which means that the emperor who was there in Rome waiting to receive Tiberius's report was this kid Caligula. Now Caligula, if you remember the name, is the complete dumpster fire of an emperor. He was awful, but early on, we didn't really know what we were going to get with him. So all we can do is speculate about what such an emperor's motives might have been. I think Tiberius wanted a reckoning. I think he'd had enough of this debacle. I think that Pilate was already hanging by a thread because of his connections to Seanus. But I think it's a different deal with Caligula. Why would Caligula be mad about Seanus? If Seanus didn't engage in that political intrigue, didn't do a little poisoning here and there, well, Tiberius's heirs would have become emperor next, not Caligula. So in a way, hey, high five from beyond the grave to you, Seanus. Now I'm in charge because of you. Further, what's the point of jabbing the bear if you're Caligula? Your reign is not yet secure. It's five years ago, probably, that the whole Seanus thing went down. Now, I think what's most likely is that your attitude toward this peon nobody governor coming from somewhere that you don't even really care about is indifference. My guess, and it's just a guess, would be that Pilate did meet with Caligula, that he did issue the report to him that was required by the law of Augustus within three months of the conclusion of a governorship, that Caligula listened with mild interest and nodded a lot and said, uh-huh, okay, wow, really all those things happened? That's that's super fascinating. I'm guessing Caligula was indifferent toward whatever report Pilate gave about the whole Jesus event, and that ultimately Caligula had no motivation to punish or kill Pilate for services rendered. I don't think anything Pilate did rose to that level of punishment. Further, I don't think Caligula would have gained any benefit from rewarding Pilate with another governorship somewhere around the empire. The thing that would make the most sense for Caligula to do is just give him his pension and let him get on with his life in obscurity somewhere else. Close that chapter of the book. Caligula goes on his way into history. I believe Pilate goes on in his way, but not everybody agrees with me on that. In fact, there's a whole bunch of tradition that points toward Pilate dying a violent, awful, horrible death. There's tradition that suggests that Caligula, or maybe even one of his successors, called Pilate back in and was like, you're going to get a dishonorable execution, or you can just do the right thing and kill yourself. And that Pilate did. And that then crazy stuff happened after that. There are also traditions that exist that have Pilate so racked with guilt that he goes up north and he sets up shop living in Switzerland, and ultimately he kills himself there because he can't overcome his feelings about Jesus. There's another tradition that has Pilate, his wife, and his family retiring somewhere into France and hanging out there and ultimately dying, presumably, as an old man, while maybe even being kind of obsessed with Jesus along the way. We'll explore all of that stuff here in just a minute. But the reason I say this is the section where it gets interesting is because this is where the Rorschach stuff kicks in. This is where people start to look at Pilate's life and project their agenda onto him. 
Quick note, this next part is going to feel at times like it wants to get overwhelmingly complicated. And that's frankly because it is very complicated subject matter. We're about to talk about 1,500 years of myths and legends and exaggerations and spider webs that go off in different directions. It's very hard to put this toothpaste back in the tube. I could not do this myself, both because of the limitations of my brain and because physically, the stuff that we're about to talk about, not all of it is documented very well. I don't have physical access to most of the stuff that's been written about Pilate, either because it's lost to history and only referenced secondarily, or because it's only recently found and it hasn't been translated to English, or it is in a language that I could theoretically try to figure out, but it's not even published on the internet, so I just have to go off of what other people say about it. That said, the reason I'm confident that we can make some sense of where all of this goes over history is because of the work of three scholars I've really benefited from. Spignu Isidorczyk, who's at the University of Winnipeg, has done a couple of works, this is all listed in the bibliography, that have been very helpful in putting some sort of order to all of this stuff. Maurice Gerard is a guy who did most of his work a little bit before Isidorczyk, and he is a guru. He has been through stacks of ancient documents trying to compare similarities between all of these slightly deviant different versions of the pilot myth and pilot story. And then finally, Tibor Gruel, who wrote one great article in the Danish Journal of History and Philology that really makes a pretty good case for a system with which we can view and make sense out of all of this. So I've depended on those three guys hugely. They deserve credit. They'll also be acknowledged in the bibliography. If you really want to go down the rabbit hole on this, it is a deep rabbit hole. And those three gentlemen will gladly take you there. We're going to go a ways down the rabbit hole. And I think that'll be plenty for our purposes. <music> It's really not that hard to figure out what the first accounting of Pilate's work in Judea must have been. Because well, he was in government. Government has paperwork. He filed reports. He communicated with his superiors. There must have been some kind of governmental record of all the stuff that happened in Judea that was far more thorough than what we get from Josephus or Philo or anybody else. And presumably, since Pilate was an important person, people would have accessed those reports and probably this stuff was floating around amongst a few curious scholars in the early days of Christianity and on into the second century. But it looks like it's really picked up steam by the early second century. And that is where what I believe to be the pivotal moment in the whole Pilate legend happens. There's a critic of Christianity, a guy named Celsus. He's a Greek thinker. He's into Egyptian thought as well. And he really doesn't like the whole Jesus thing. So he writes this tract that is highly critical of Christianity. We don't have it anymore, but all the, the tract apparently was so influential that all these key early church thinkers wrote against it. And we can reestablish the full text of his tract just from what Christians quoted in pushing back on him. So in this tract, Celsus makes a fascinating argument against Christianity that hinges on the fate of Pontius Pilate. And he makes some pretty Greek assumptions in constructing this argument about karma. You do good stuff, you get good results. You do bad stuff, you get bad results. And also what to expect when humans interact with Greek deities. Well, he cites a myth about Pentheus, the king of Thebes, and his interaction with Dionysus, the god of wine, getting liquored up and getting people into provocative situations in a group setting. This god was known to manifest as a human and mingle with the common folk to spice things up a little bit. And, well, the king of Thebes was having nothing to do with it. There had been entirely too much spicing things up, in his opinion. And so he banned the worship of Dionysus. Dionysus gets word of it. He shows up in Thebes in disguise, and King Pentheus mistreats him. Well, Dionysus is not one to be trifled with, so he tricks Pentheus into going to spy on some naked ladies who are under the influence of Dionysus' booze or mind games, and as Pentheus sneaks up, they all see him, but Dionysus has made Pentheus appear to them as a lion. So they all go crazy and grab rocks and sticks and knives and stuff, and they kill 
the lion, who's actually their king and family member, and they cut off his head, and it's actually his mom who is with this group of women who parades back into the city with her son's head saying, look, we killed a lion. And then as she comes out of the Dionysus-infused haze, she's like, oh, nuts, that's my son. That's incredibly disappointing. I wish I hadn't done that. And that is the lesson of divine retribution. Here's where the argument comes in. Celsus suggests that if Pontius Pilate did these horrible things to a god who had taken on human flesh, then Pontius Pilate should have suffered some horrible divine retribution. But according to Celsus, he did not. So what gives, Christians? And it is this question that is going to fuel so much of the trajectory of Pilate literature moving forward. The first significant Christian to respond to Celsus's Pilate-based attack against Christianity is Origen. Very important church leader, did the first half of his career in North Africa and Alexandria, did the second half of his career in Caesarea in Judea. And his response is very telling because he doesn't dispute in any way that Pilate lived out his life or at least didn't suffer divine retribution from God. Instead, Origen suggests that the reason that no divine retribution was suffered on the part of Pilate is because it wasn't his fault. It was the Jews. The Jews were the ones who murdered Jesus. They were the ones who were corrupt. And as a result, just look at all the calamities that have befallen them. So what an interesting response. Instead of saying something like, well, divine retribution, at least the way you're picturing it, Celsus, that's more of a Greek mythology thing. In the tradition of Christianity, it's not really how it works because of who the character of Jesus is. Instead of doing that, he instead, I guess, assumes that karma or this divine retribution thing was normal, but simply shifts the blame. In fact, in the opening lines of the pseudepigraphal Gospel of Peter, we've got Herod taking full responsibility for the execution of Jesus. We've got Pilate stepping back and saying, I don't want anything to do with this. And then we've got Herod telling his men, go execute Jesus just like I ordered you to do and do it right away. Paraphrases mine, real text is right down here. This, I believe, is indicative of the first of three distinct historical trajectories for Pilate literature. So once again, Celsus comes out, fires this attack based on Pilate's fate, and response number one to solve Celsus's problem is to say, wasn't Pilate's fault, it was the Jews' fault, and that is why Pilate did not receive divine retribution. The second response gets us into the deep water here. The second response is to say, well, the reason that Pilate didn't receive divine retribution is because Pilate became a Christian. Why would God divine retribute somebody who became a Christian, after all? Now, there are a bunch of insignificant or less oft-repeated legends, stories, myths, apocryphal pieces of literature that suggest that Pilate became a Christian after his encounter with Jesus while reflecting on the steps where Jesus was earlier in the day. There are some other accounts that suggest that Pilate was a Christian all along. He saw this for what it is. There are even some that go so far as to suggest that Pilate is the one who really knew what was up with Jesus. And the Jews wanted to get him, sure, but Pilate is the one who secretly sent out protectors and allowed the entire ministry of Jesus to unfold unmolested. In doing so, I guess he gets credit for the whole Jesus cross Christianity thing working out. It gets pretty absurd. But there is one big, central, famous account that is the famousest of all of the pilot literature that comes into play in this second thread of pilot literature. And that is the Acts of Pilate, also known as the Gospel of Nicodemus. You'll see it referred to in fancy books sometimes as AP, Acts of Pilate, or Gospel of Nicodemus, GN. It's called the Gospel of Nicodemus because it's written from the perspective of Nicodemus, even though this was very obviously written hundreds of years after the fact. So what happens in this gospel is that Jesus is conversing with Pilate and then in come all these witnesses and the witnesses line up and they start saying, well, I had an encounter with Jesus. This miraculous thing happened and Jesus is God and the son of God and you should not execute him or whatever the conclusion is. Now, it becomes clear that 
These are all people who received famous biblical miracles in the gospels. Now they're all, they're all lining up to do Jesus a solid somewhere along the line in this acts of Pilate. Pilate's heart is softened. He is responsive to Jesus. Pilate is also persuaded by the words of his wife, Procula, who has a vision about Jesus. Something like that is alluded to in Matthew chapter 27 in the Bible. But in the Acts of Pilate, it seems like this just keeps being expanded through the centuries. And that's kind of the funny thing about this document is that it really isn't one document. When I say the Acts of Pilate, you might go and Google that and be like, oh, I found it. There's the full text that right there. That's the Acts of Pilate, but not really. There are tons of versions of this. It seems like through history, there was absolute free reign granted to anybody who wanted to add anything to this that they felt like. And so when we look at a a book like Luke from the New Testament, and we look at the manuscript evidence supporting that, we see tremendous agreement, overwhelming agreement from copy to copy to copy, even through the centuries, even as language is evolving. And the reason for that, I believe, is that people viewed it as scripture. You may not think it's scripture, but they did. And the care that they took points to that. It doesn't look like anybody thought the Acts of Pilate was scripture ever. It looks like people understood this was credited to somebody who's been dead for hundreds of years. He obviously didn't rise from the dead to show up and write this thing out. So much of the data from the first chunk, the first iteration of the Acts of Pilate, are all straight out of the Bible, just arranged and mishmashed a little differently with some connective tissue in terms of conversational stuff to make it all flow together. It isn't until a little later on that we see a second portion of the Acts of Pilate start to gain popularity. People think this is maybe 5th century, 6th century, and in this part we get the account of the execution and resurrection, and ultimately some kind of appendix where a couple of dead guys come back from hell and give the account of what it was like when Jesus visited there during the three days in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Looks like then, even further after the fact, there is a prologue with dramatic language added on. And from there, I'm telling you, it just spider webs in a ton of different directions. Here's the bottom line, though. All of the directions that come out of this middle, second path of Pilate characterizations in literature throughout the centuries, all of them paint Pilate as having become a Christian. Did he become a Christian and die in the Holy Land? Maybe. There's more traditions that suggest that he became a Christian and died somewhere in Europe. Indeed, Irenaeus of Lyon gave an account of a group of Christians who venerated a painting of Jesus somewhere in the second century. Well, the interesting thing is that there is also a tradition that Pilate died in Vienna, France, which is just I mean, that's stone's throw down the road from Lyon. They've got a great big Egyptian looking obelisk there that you can still go and see that supposedly marks the turnaround point of a hippodrome, a horse track, a circus. And it says the remains of Pilate are right around here somewhere. So it is a memorial to Pontius Pilate. There's yet another tradition that has Pilate going and founding the New Testament church of Lydda and playing some role in that. I don't know. Whatever you think or like to imagine might have happened, we can say this for sure. In the Eastern Church, people have a higher regard for Pilate than they do in the Western Church. In the Ethiopian Church, Pilate is known as Saint Pilate and his wife as Saint Procula. Nobody in the West that I know of thinks that. So it really is a geographical breakdown when it comes to this. And as a result, most of this spider webbing we see coming out of the second thread of Pilate literature through the centuries tends to be in Coptic, Syriac, or Greek, all Eastern languages, and they tend to be produced in the East where people really liked Pilate. So we've got one thread that is unified around the idea that Pilate was a horrified bystander and that it was the Jews' fault that Jesus got executed. We have a very expansive second thread that says Pontius Pilate was a Christian. That's why he didn't receive divine retribution. And further, he should be regarded as a saint. But the third thread counters Celsus's little argument about Pilate in a different way. This thread says, what? 
where did you hear that Pontius Pilate didn't receive divine retribution? He absolutely did. And this thread is referenced by the church historian Eusebius in the early 4th century, who, while acknowledging he doesn't really have sources for this and is depending on tradition, suggests that Pilate made that fateful trip back from Judea, didn't interact with Tiberius, did interact with Caligula, and Caligula wasn't impressed, and Pilate killed himself. Now, there is further literature that comes along. One of the most interesting that I found was one called Mors Palati, which has Pilate being killed or killing himself, and then has his body gets thrown into the Tiber River in Rome, but it doesn't just sit there. A whole bunch of demons and monsters and spirits show up and they churn up the water and cause all this agitation. And so they have to fish his body out of the river. They're like, I don't know, throw it in some other river. They put it in France. And so they throw his body in the Rhone River, which is interesting because that again runs right by Vienna, the place I mentioned a minute ago that has the obelisk and the tradition about him being there. I don't know how this all adds up. And the same thing happens in that river with the goblins and ghosts and spirits and everything else. And so they have to fish his body out of yet another prominent European river and they bury him in Switzerland and hope that that'll do the trick. But there's still this haunting that goes on and it's just terrible. There's another tradition and I, for the life of me, cannot track down where it came from anywhere other than this 120 year old Bible dictionary that gives some local account that apparently some people in Switzerland were repeating at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, regarding Pilate moving to Lucerne, Switzerland, or the mountains around there, one in particular called Mount Pilatus. That's really what it's called. And at Mount Pilatus, he was so overcome with guilt about what he did to Jesus that he threw himself into the lake on top of the mountain where he drowned. And the legend goes that on every Good Friday, he emerges from the lake trying to wash his hands clean like Lady Macbeth, but to no avail, because that guilt will never go away. I Google earthed this and I can't find any lake on top of Mount Pilatus, but uh, it's legend. This is the way these things work. Long story short, this third tradition is the one where it was all Pilate's fault and God did punish him. And he punished him apparently in all kinds of elaborate, creative, even very pagan looking ways through the centuries. Once again, none of these are a singular work. All of these spider web in their own direction. But I believe that these three prongs can all be traced back to responses to that initial foray thrown out by Celsus in the second century. But I want to push my luck just a little bit and argue that there's actually a fourth tradition having to do with Pilate. And this one's an invisible tradition because it's rooted in the biblical theological idea that Jesus isn't really about divine retribution. If anything, Jesus came to satisfy and ameliorate the notion of divine retribution by himself being a sacrifice for the sins and failures of all of humanity, Herod, Pilate, you, me, everybody included, Jesus went to the cross for that. So the reason, Celsus, that there would be no divine retribution for Pilate is that that really isn't the way the game's going to be played moving forward because of what Jesus did. And I would say this fourth tradition manifests in silence. Okay, argument from silence. I know that's like literally the wrong thing to do, but... I think there had to have been a whole bunch of people who said, oh my goodness, this pilot stuff again, this is nonsense. I don't have any Rorschach projection for that because it's irrelevant. Jesus is the character who matters. Pilot does not matter at all. And I am imagining that there were a whole bunch of people who absolutely rolled their eyes at all of these traditions. But in addition to these three literary trajectories about Pilate that Christians produced, there's also a competing batch of pilot literature from people who didn't like Christianity, all following in the footsteps of Celsus. Eusebius references some of this literature. Apparently, there was a document called The Acts of Pilate, and based on the way Eusebius describes it, which is not flattering, the original Acts of Pilate was actually a tract that was against Christianity, that in some way 
Rorschach projected onto Pilate a hostility toward Jesus or something. This is an entirely lost text that made people like Eusebius hopping mad because of how much falsehood he believed it contained. Then we fast forward a little bit to right before the era of Constantine and the Edict of Milan when he declared Christianity a tolerated religion in 314 AD, and there's this emperor who precedes him who apparently produced some kind of anti-Christian school curriculum, some set of pilot papers, if you will, that kids had to learn around the empire to help provide a justification and an undergirding for the empire's anti-Christian policies that this emperor was advancing. All right, stepping back from all of this, when we take into account all this pilot literature from all of these different perspectives, we get what Maurice Girard refers to as the pilot cycle. This is a term that I think he coined and other scholars seem to be using it as well, but I think he just means by pilot cycle, this phenomenon where one ambiguous character in history takes on all of these different meanings. I've been using the term a historical Rorschach test. Call it whatever you want. It is fascinating whether you're into Jesus or not, whether you're into history or not, whether you think pilot matters or not, whatever religion or not religion you're from, just look at what the human imagination and human brain can do. But also I want to stop you short of saying, Oh, that's probably what the Bible just is too then, because wasn't that just, again, just copies of copies and imitations and fan fiction. But like I said earlier, no, it really is materially different in what it holds itself out as being. The Bible, in all of its incarnations, holds itself out as being accurate. And the manuscript evidence, whether you believe what it records or not, the manuscript evidence is very, very steady for the New Testament. Whereas the pilot stuff, it seems like even the people who wrote it knew that they were just goofing around or advancing an agenda. The funny thing about it all, this this pilot cycle, is that it certainly has shreds of truth. But at some point, we just got to pump the brakes here. We could do this forever, trying to track down each and every little thread of this pilot cycle, and we're never going to get it done. And further, we haven't even touched on the corresponding literary cycle associated with his wife, Claudia Procula. People were still writing about her and in her name all the way into the early modern age. And part of the reason we're not talking about it here is because it's all an extension of the pilot cycle and it all follows those same three paths. So we don't really gain any new information from it. Here's the thing. There's only so far down that rabbit hole we can go, and I think we've gone far enough for you to get a sense of what all of this literature is about and why it's so hard to really distill anything useful from it. Which leads us to, I think, the one really obvious remaining question. That being, who actually was Pontius Pilate when we cut through all the noise? Here's the stuff that I think we can say for sure after looking at the evidence we've looked at together. One, he was definitely a dude who definitely lived. He was definitely governor of Judea from about 2627 to about 36 AD, which means he was appointed during the reign of the emperor Tiberius, but he was appointed at a time where we know that Tiberius was out of the pocket and the guy making the decisions was Aelius Sianus. We get the impression that Sianus and Pilate had some negative presuppositions about the people he was going to govern. Whether those presuppositions were real or not, there are definitely issues, and it played out as though there were. All kinds of ugly incidents, many of which result in violence, ensue over this 10-year period, and right in the middle of it, you've got the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, which lines up with the biblical account, probably 30 AD or just a little bit after that. We know that his... Time as governor concludes after an incident that involved violence once again with some Samaritans and that he went home in 36, but that Tiberius was dead by the time he got there. And then we know that the reliable trail again goes cold at that point. So what is the most probable description of Pilate's life after that? 
Well, I think a pretty good case could be made for the Vienna-France tradition. There's a lot of smoke there. Maybe there's some fire. you got all kinds of legends that have him going there. You've got a reliable source saying there's a group of people here, Christians who venerate this painting that they say is from Pontius Pilate. You've got that obelisk in Vienna, France that's still there to this day that says this is the place where Pilate died and his body is near here. There's enough to triangulate a story that would have a distraught pilot who saw some crazy stuff he couldn't explain, who nobody cares about anymore in terms of his usefulness for government. He goes and retires in Gaul, and he's obsessed with this thing that happened this one time where he worked. And maybe we even get a picture of a guy who obsessively is painting pictures of the face of Jesus to remember the visage of this most inexplicable character he encountered. I don't know that the Vienna-France tradition necessarily requires us to think that Pilate was a good guy, a bad guy, or anything in between, but it seems like, again, there's a lot of smoke there. Maybe there's some fire. I don't think there's much credence to the Switzerland tradition. That sounds more like a legend, but I think you can also make a decent case for a version of Pilate's later life that unfolds in the Eastern Mediterranean. He's regarded as a saint there. We've got a little bit of tradition that has him helping to found the church at Lydda. We've also got this suggestion that maybe they ended up in Ephesus. There's this little verse in 2 Timothy 4.21 that references a saint or an important woman there named Claudia. Could this be Claudia Procula? I don't know. The tradition that has him going off and just dying immediately after his return, to me, is the weakest of the traditions. He did pretty Roman things while he was there and governing. If every time a governor comes home after a 10-year run, you just execute him because a few things didn't go the way you want, that's not going to inspire a lot of people to want to follow you as a young, brand new leader, which Emperor Caligula was when Pilate would have given his report. I just don't think there was any political advantage to Pilate getting scolded and told to kill himself. I think the only advantage such a narrative provides is to certain people who need to do that projective Rorschach test with Pilate and make him into somebody who was really bad and did receive some kind of divine punishment from God for the bad things that he did to Jesus. I guess right now, if you're going to pin me down, I think... I think I would barely pick the Vienna, France tradition over all of the others, but ah, there's so much myth and legend to cut through. It's really hard to say, though it is very fun to speculate and try to game the thing out. What I'm really interested in is what dots you connect. This has been an avalanche of data for you to consider about Pilate, kind of secondarily about Christianity and about Jesus and about history and how we do it and how we sort through things that have the credibility level of the manuscript evidence for the Bible versus the much lower credibility level of the manuscript evidence for the acts of Pilate and the whole Pilate cycle in general. It's a lot, and I get that. But because it's a lot, you might see stuff that I didn't catch. So this is maybe the most I've ever looked forward to a comment section I can't wait to hear your theories, what you've heard, what you've seen, and to kick it around with you. And I don't know, maybe we come up with like the ultimate solution to what most likely happened with Pilot right here in the comments. Whatever the case, you've been awesome because I set out at the beginning of this thing to make a little cute five minute video. Like, oh, the acts of Pilot, that's kind of interesting. I'll read it and I'll explain what that's about. And then, oh, wow. The red thumbtacks and yarn and wall murals came out and me writing things like, what is the conclusion? Who did this? Who actually wrote it? And staring at it for weeks. It's been like six weeks that I've been going on this thing really hard. And that's been a lot of fun, but it also means that this hasn't been a five minute video and you're still here. So thank you for caring about things like this. Thank you for being curious. Thank you also to all of you, especially who don't believe the same things that I do about the Bible. I'm, I'm a Christian. You probably knew that, but I don't know if this is your first time on the channel. Maybe you didn't know that. I'm a Christian. I think there's credibility to this Jesus stuff and this Bible stuff, but I know not all of you think that. And if you're still here and you don't think the same stuff as me, props to you for being able to separate 
personal religious conviction from just enjoyable scholarship and chasing down some of the really fun mysteries in history. So thank you for being here, all of you. Thank you especially to the couple hundred people at this point who have decided that they want to support this channel financially so that I can do stuff like this. The reason that I can take all the free time I can muster over six weeks and dig this deep into a surprisingly interesting topic is because you exist and you decided to throw a few bucks per video at this thing. So I know I say it all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are why this video happened. And if you hated this video, I guess uh, that might be a different equation. But again, if you're still here, I'm guessing you just had fun with me. So thank you to all the patrons. If you would like to be a part of that, I'd sure welcome it. It's a huge help. You can do that at patreon.com slash TMBH. It's the kind of thing, if you haven't heard of Patreon, where you can go and pledge a couple bucks, five bucks per video, whatever seems good to you, and uh, support content that you like and that pushes you and that you enjoy on the internet. If you're not into that kind of thing and you're like, I enjoyed your video, but I'm not putting money behind it, that is totally cool too. I'm just thrilled that you're here. Thanks for having the conversation with me. I'm Matt. This is a 10-minute Bible hour. Once again, looking forward to that comment section. Jump in. We'll see you soon. Thank you.